all crews, I have fire in the valley, and it appears to be moving our direction. Riker, from engine 15, go ahead. I think you might want to get out of that area. Copy that, we're leaving. All companies on Riker Division, be advised, fire's coming. About the first three weeks we would come out here and I'd look at my favorite view and think can I ever can I ever look out there again and not be sad we realized that we would be able to we won't have a forest but we'll have a beautiful meadow and you can't beat the sky so it just feels like a hard day I mean, you could see the smoke from the highway. So as I'm getting off the highway, I saw the smoke. And I say to my son, Sam, you know, honey, I just saw some smoke. I just, I don't think there's any way it's gonna get to us, but let's just pack up those few things that we made a list about last year. So he and I left at about three o'clock. And then my husband had, came home from work after we left. And he was home for a little while and uh, the sheriff came to the door and knocked and said, it has crossed Black Forest Road, which is right at the edge of our property. You need to leave right now. I'm not leaving until you do. My husband could grab what he had in his hands and walked out the door and left. And he got about a mile up Black Forest Road, maybe a mile and a half, and stopped and turned around and took pictures. And at that point, you can see the black plumes amidst the rest of the smoke. So we're pretty certain that the house was gone by 5 or 5.15 on Tuesday. We've painted ourselves into a very difficult corner. The more aggressive we've been fighting our fire problem, the worse we've made the fire problem. And for a century here in the United States, we've been putting out wildfires. But if you put out wildfires and then don't find another way to remove the fuel that would have burned in that forest, then you're increasing the fuel load in that forest. For instance, if you have a, a, a landscape that naturally would burn, say, every 30 years, and you put out every fire on that landscape for a century, then you're going to have three times more fuel on that landscape than would naturally be there. Colorado has broken its most destructive fire record four times in four years. We're seeing fire behaviors that we've never seen before. I think that what's happened with the way fire gets handled nationally uh, depends on a number of factors that have brought us into what is basically a new world uh, in fire. The most important phenomenon in dealing with fire in the last 25 years has been the unbounded uh, development of housing within previously wild areas. Uh, the fire landscape, the fire habitat is being invaded uh, by people, for the most part, uh, in a way that isn't compatible with fire. Look at the city of Colorado Springs and Fort Collins and these other cities. We're pushing out into areas that we've never lived in before. You know, we're right amongst the trees. We're in the, the scrub oak. We're in areas that, in the natural course of events, every hundred years or so, a forest should burn off. You know, wildfire is one of the few natural uh, disasters that we actually uh, uh, tell people that we can stop. 
And so you end up with a very large population at risk that has expectations of society that society is often not capable of meeting. Um, you know, these fires that we're seeing now are burning so much bigger, so much hotter, and so much faster that um, we're really expecting firefighters to go in and take really unfair risks on behalf of property owners who are living in a, in a dangerous place. There's areas of town that I will not put people in if I'm in command or if I'm on an engine company because the chances of me getting in and out of that area, if there's a, a big wildland fire in the area, if I don't feel that my people can get in and out safely, and we do take risks, but you know, nowhere did I ever sign on with the city that said I would die for you. I'm not gonna willingly put my people in a situation that I know they're not gonna come out alive. Something was, I would say, odd that Tuesday morning. The fire was progressing a little faster, I think, and we had a thunderstorm about 12 miles west of the city that was developing. Um, that thunderstorm collapsed early afternoon. I was getting my task force in position, and we were prepared for this. I see heavy fire. I'm sitting here with a dozer just off of Flying W. I've probably got at least 100 yards on the top of this ridge, and it's just uh, it's hard right now. Oh my God, Dad, come here, look at this. Holy shit. All crews, I've had the fire jump again about another 100, 200 yards. It's starting to build in intensity. Oh my gosh. Look at this. This is unbelievable. It's all the way down the hill, dude. Look at this. We gotta go. Oh my gosh. We were in this field and we're watching the fire come over the last ridge before the city of Colorado Springs. And at one point I was actually standing on the hood of my Yukon to see this fire and we had this uh, National Forest helicopter coming over us. We were watching the pilot and on his third pass he banked hard to the left and he looked at us and I could see his eyes and he does this to us. And that moment our world changed. The, calm 10 mile an hour winds that we had shifted to about 65 mile an hour winds and when that happened that fire just exploded and it turned it into an inferno copy i think this fire is spreading to the fly flying w ranch their buildings uh i know it's a thick cover in there that's going to be uh, one of your big concerns right now copy that we are not going to worry about flying w i want no units back in the flying w ranch area Riker, from engine 15. Go ahead. I think you might want to get out of that area. I stood in that field and I'm watching, and I had a hundred foot wall of flame from north to south, and that's all I saw. I have embers the size of my fist flying by me on fire, and I have never seen anything in that, even close to that. All companies on command six. We are leaving the area. I repeat, our fallback position is to be the park. We are leaving the area. Pull out now. I knew my crews were getting out of the area. I had called for a retreat. We knew that we didn't have all the civilians out of that area because at this point they were still, it wasn't a mandatory evacuation until about an hour before that when we pulled the hook. I'm worried about the firefighters. I don't know how many civilians we have in the area. And we're literally leaving as that fire is less than 100 yards behind us, 100 foot high. And visibility now is down to the front of my hood of the truck that I'm in. I can't see the next vehicle in front of me. The fire blowing at 65 miles an hour, there's nothing we could have done. I actually had people say that have much more wildland training than me, you know, we're not too sure why you evacuated because we would have probably stayed in place. But the more we think about it, if we would have stayed in place, we would have killed firefighters. I've got hundreds of houses on fire. I've got this huge fire blowing up on top of me. In my mind, I thought, okay, in 20 minute mark, we're gonna send the crews back in. And that was Lieutenant Pellegrino and his crew. Uh, without hesitation, they went right back into that area for me. As they advanced through that, they called back to me and they told me, and then I would backfill. I would send two, three engines. Ryan W. Majestic, I can see eight to ten structures on fire, so we can save some of them. Task Force 2 to Riker, we've got um, uh, way too many houses to be able to take these on. We're going to have to do structure protection only. We have so many going. I've got eyes on the top of Wilson. Everything's pretty much burned to the ground. 
Can I send units into that area? Are there other uh, salvageable houses? We're driving through one, two, about ten houses that are stick frame all the way to the ground. The lieutenants and the captains on, the, on those engines and trucks that night had to make decisions that they would probably never make in their career. This engine come rolling by, it was my nephew, and he was just looking at me as he went in, he just sort of waved, and I thought, if something happens to anyone on this job, because I know these people, I, I, I don't know what I would do. And, but let's go back to Bill Pellegrino. I've known that man for 28 years. And I know his wife, I know his children. And I'm thinking, I'm putting these people in probably the biggest harm they've ever faced in their careers. And I'm the man putting them up there. And it was tough, it was really tough to start sending crews in. There's not a day since Waldo Canyon happened that I don't drive down I-25 and I can see it every day I drive into work. And I think it could have been worse, you know, it, it could have been worse. And it's gonna happen again. That's what people I don't think truly understand. Um, it's gonna happen again. There's an awful lot of judgment involved in this. And the people who are being asked to uh, exercise that judgment uh, are the firefighters. And they don't have a clear vision from the top on down on how they should proceed. Uh, you have a prescription for an occasional disaster. And in 2013, you had uh, the Yarnell Hill fire, which resulted in the death of uh, an entire uh, hotshot crew, 19 members. Uh, one was missing because he'd been a lookout and had gotten out early. Got fire right over here now. So, is Granite Mountain still in there? Well, they're in a safety Grand Mountain 7, how do you copy me? Yeah, there. I hear saws running, that's not good. Operations, Bravo 33, uh, call. Attack! Grand Mountain 7! This ain't good, though. Okay, uh, unit that's hollered in the radio, I need you to quit and, uh, break operations, Bravo 33. Okay, Grand Mountain 7 sounds like they got some trouble. Okay, I'm here with Grand Mountain Hot Shots. Your escape route has been cut off. We are preparing a deployment site. And we are burning out around ourselves in the brush. And I'll give you a call when we are under the, sh the shelters. Okay, copy that. So you're on the south side of the fire then? You have to go back over a century to 1910 to find a greater loss of life on a designated wildland fire crew. I mean, that's catastrophic. What was that crew doing? Well, we don't know exactly what they were doing, but uh, the best speculation, uh, including by their supervisor, was that they had left a relatively safe position and were trying to make their way back to a place where they could re-engage the fire and protect structures. That's not what a wildland fire crew is supposed to do. If you have people moving into a floodplain with the absolute certainty that floods are gonna happen and carry away their houses and they still insist on doing it, are you as the uh, federal government responsible for the catastrophic consequences? Uh, that's kind of what's happening with fire and people move into fire habitat they should figure that fire is going to be part of their lives. We actually are seeing uh, an increase in, of movement towards these uh, very flammable areas. 
Um, so the red zone had a, uh, more than 100,000 people move into it between 2000 and 2010. The reality is that these developments are you know, approved by you know, county commissioners, by local governments. So the county gets the benefit of uh, some tax base and the developer gets the benefit of the business of building these homes, but the cost of protecting all of this is borne by uh, people that will never see that home, you know, the, the federal taxpayer at large. I think Colorado's done well with um, uh, what we call multiple objective fires, and that's a fairly new concept. I think the West Fork fire is a perfect example of a fire that's been managed for multiple objectives. So they fought really hard to protect some towns and from some infrastructure, and they let other parts of that fire just completely go and do its thing. It's a beautiful place we live in, but to live in such a beautiful place, there are sacrifices, and our sacrifices, uh, we stress to work three months to make enough money for 12. And right now, due to what's happened here, our three months of income, which is really 12 months of income, is in serious jeopardy. The public meetings have been very clear that there's going to be smoke burning up there until the snow flies. Obviously, this is an event that's not going to go away anytime soon. There's just too much wilderness and too much dead stuff to burn, meaning beetle kill timber. So the West Fork complex comprised of the Papoose fire, the West Fork fire, and the Windy Pass fire, three fires total. We got stretched thin in a hurry as far as resources go, trying to initial attack all of the fires we got. Not knowing exactly how and when the fires would move onto the Rio Grande, we had talked about fire in the wilderness areas and we had discussed from a management standpoint what we wanted to do with that. And one of our primary factors we looked at was safety. And so we made the decision that if we had fire in the wilderness, um, we weren't just gonna put firefighters at risk to go suppress that fire. Uh, our forest has uh, extensive dead in the spruce fir zone. So when you combine that with the fire behavior we were seeing, there's some real risk there. And so as we looked at that, we had decided, as long as it's in the wilderness, we're comfortable with it. It was a suppression fire from, for us from the start, but trying to balance that suppression action with the risk associated with it to those firefighters. Um, if you go back far enough, we used to have some policies um, that we tried to, if we were gonna initial attack a fire and put it out, it was out by a certain point in the day. And that's a, that's a rigid, hardened, you know, cut and dry type philosophy and, and fire is just really, really way too dynamic for that in my opinion. We now understand that this policy of active suppression of everything was probably the wrong thing to do. But now we, uh, there's been all these other factors that have come in. Now that we understand that, the world has changed. Any of the large towns in the West look at the growth since the 1960s and the 1970s and you can kind of understand how that has come to pass. Uh, there are increasing discussions about the red zone restrictions. Counties and municipalities and local governments have some authority when it comes to building codes. It's an important discussion to have, but in Colorado, of course, we want to balance individual freedom uh, with the common good. Well, when you have a, a bad year, uh, the Congress generally throws money at fire. Uh, but that's a problem because in future years, uh, take this year, 2013, for example, you wind up halfway through the season where the Forest Service ran out of money for fire. So they took $600 million from other programs. The suppression budget in the last 15 years has gone up four times. The restoration prevention budget has gone down by about a third. What you're doing is you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're robbing the forest uh, restoration budget in order to pay for forest suppression. This is stupid, and it hasn't been rectified. Uh, preventing fires is a lot cheaper than fighting fires. An ounce of prevention uh, is greater than a pound of cure. It really applies when it comes to preventing fires from happening. You worry about it in regards to how it affects your management. On these active years, they actually have to come take part of our budget for on the ground management to pay for fire suppression. If we could, if we could find the right balance and we're always seeking it, sometimes you hit it, sometimes you don't, 
of being able to let fire play more of a role than we currently do. I would like that, but on the other side, all I care about is keeping the communities I serve and the firefighters and the people we ask, the emergency personnel that we ask to come in, I want them to be safe. The weather was perfect for a big fire. You had high temperature, um, low humidity, and high winds, and all those things put together, just a perfect combination for a big fire. Fire dispatch 592 X-rays en route through 83 and Troop. Yeah, I think we, we can catch it right here at this uh, top house on Falcon. The first spot fire that we saw was about 300 feet away from the house. So we started fighting that, and we, we noticed that the winds were definitely very strong. And then we noticed to our right that there was another spot fire. We looked over to our left, there was another one. So we're fighting it, and the whole time we can't see the main fire because it's on the other side of the house that the other crews were on. Literally in seconds, the garage that was right next to the house they were protecting blew up. We have a big wind storm pushing the fire to the west. Garage is involved, house is almost involved. I'm pulling everybody out of here at the moment. And our Peregrine has been overrun. Our Peregrine has been overrun. It consumed this three-car garage. The whole thing was on fire in just a moment. Um, from there, then it just went into these 40 and 60 foot trees. I've never really witnessed a, a, a crowning fire take place. Uh, it was definitely uh, an earth moving moment for, for me and Jessica. Here it comes. When that fire becomes a crowning fire, when it's up in the crowns of the trees and it's leaping from tree to tree to tree and it becomes a 200 foot wall of fire, nobody goes into that. You're not gonna do a darn thing for that. It went fast. Once it went to the crowns, it, it was moving fast. At that point, we knew that it was, it was big. It wasn't just gonna stop. I didn't realize how bad it was until we got down there. You could tell that it was um, really uh, intense fire. It was growing rapidly. The main fire had already gone through the area we were in. I can't even count how many houses that in that area were completely destroyed uh, before we even got there. So we, uh, we started heading back down Holmes and we found um, a home on Tia Lane. We just went to work trying to put it out as much as best we could from the outside. And at one point we lost, um, we lost our water supply. Uh, because we didn't have any hydrants in the area, we were just relying on um, water tenders. We weren't able to stop it at that point. It just, it kind of does what it wants. So we basically stood by and kind of had to let it go, which, you know, was very difficult. They fought and they fought so hard to try to save my house. But when they realized that it was toast, this one went in. He had no idea. I don't think what he was looking for. At one point, I, I saw an object that was on top of a shelf. So I pulled it off and then um, just kind of pulled it toward the window and then um, reached down and picked it up. And that's when I kind of realized it was, it was an urn. Um. My oldest son's ashes was, it was in a, a, a black urn. And he grabbed that, and by that time the house was really, really in flames. Somebody or something led him to, to those ashes. It was nothing short of a miracle. I tried once to do a story about Indian fires, uh, Indian, modern day Indians fighting fire. And I thought, well, you know, there's gotta be a landmark Indian fire where a bunch of them got killed and it's too bad, but they learned from it. There isn't. What there is, is a sense of working with a fire on the part of the Indians. It's almost a spiritual sense that the fire will let you know when it's ready to be fought. And when it isn't ready to be fought, you go sit down somewhere else where it's nice and safe and wait. 
And they've done that for as long as they've fought fire, and they don't have a major landmark crew wiped out uh, kind of fire. In the last couple of years, we've had some very serious fires in Colorado. High Park and Waldo Canyon, Black Forest, where we've lost a number of homes to, to rapidly spreading wildfire. We dodged a bullet in each of those circumstances. We're very lucky that we did not get any firefighters killed. We have to mitigate, we have to take care of these problems, and we just get fight. You know, people are fighting us all the time because they want to they wanna live and they want that big pine right next to their house. Well, it doesn't work real well when, when it's on fire. We're going to do everything we can to protect lives. Um, whether, whether there's values at risk, but they're indefensible, the uh, expectation that firefighters go in there and defend them is, 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 is unreasonable. Is there an easy solution to this? No, there isn't. And there is nothing in sight that is going to make it perfect. What more can you do? Well, you can have a culture uh, that is a little more resilient in the face of fire. And in order to do that, you have to let firefighters know that they're going to let the fire burn homes sometimes. Well, it's kind of sad to see the fireplace go yesterday. But that happens. You got to go with the flow. So things have a way of working out like they're supposed to. Why we're not supposed to question, I guess. And look out across there and see all the brown trees. And it kind of set you back. But this old forest has seen forest fires before. <laughs>